Hello and a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on our program this week. Ten years on, what happened to Egypt's revolution? Today, many of the voices of opposition are languishing in prison. Israel's massive vaccine drive is extended to 16 to 18 year olds. This in a bid to slow infections among young people. Palestinians, however, are still waiting for their COVID jabs. Also coming up, living and working amidst the pandemic, we'll be speaking to Palestinian chef Judy Kala about how she has reinvented her career. We start in Egypt this week, which is marking its 10th anniversary of a revolution that ousted long-term dictator Hosni Mubarak. Today, after a turbulent decade, Egyptians are living under a military rule that has restricted their social and political freedoms. Those targeted include journalists, activists, academics and human rights campaigners. Here's a report from our team on the ground. Getting ready to move out. Hossam Bagat, the acting head of this human rights organization, is making sure everything is in order. Because we had to move before the end of January and so... Uh... If the landlord has asked his tenants to leave, it's because last November, three members of their staff were imprisoned by the authorities for belonging to a terrorist group. Following an international outcry, they were released after just three weeks. A grotesque situation in which freedoms are threatened in the name of the fight against terrorism. Well, terrorism became a meaningless word um, uh, when uh, Sisi was elected president in 2014. He changed the terrorism law and basically made everything terrorism. So, and the problem is the s prosecution authorities, the judiciary, be uh, started supporting this, became part of this machine. No one is safe, and I think every Egyptian uh, understands this now. In September 2019, at least 4,000 people were arbitrarily detained. This young Egyptian was arrested whilst filming protests with his mobile phone and was jailed for 12 days. Today, Egypt has around 60,000 political prisoners, although, according to human rights groups, this figure is an underestimate. Staying with Egypt, the country kicked off its vaccination campaign over the weekend and those working on the front lines are being given priority, so a doctor and a nurse were the first to receive the Chinese-made jab. According to health officials, over 35 medical centres will be set up in the coming weeks to inoculate a population that has already lost some 10,000 lives to the virus. Over to Israel, which has administered over 2.5 million COVID jabs to date, making it the world's vaccine leader. Earlier this week, the country extended its campaign to teenagers as young as 16 so that they can attend school. However, the Jewish state is under fire for leaving Palestinians to fend for themselves, with one official even saying, and I quote, this is not our job. There's not a soul to be seen at Ben Gurion Airport. No planes are taking off or landing, as Israel suspended nearly all passenger flights to curb the spread of new coronavirus variants. We're closing the skies hermetically, save for rare exceptions, to prevent the entry of virus mutations and to ensure that we make swift progress with our vaccination campaign. Israel is leading the world in the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. As countries around the world are struggling to get them, the nation of 9 million inhabitants has secured more shots than it needs thanks in part to a deal it reached with Pfizer to share clinical data in exchange for a swift and steady supply of doses. It's on track to vaccinating all adults by March and has started inoculating teenagers. We have no choice. The vaccines are already here and I have my final exams in a few weeks, so I feel I must take it. Wherever I go, I won't be given access until I'm vaccinated. Despite the breakneck immunization drive, Israel is under a third coronavirus lockdown. The restrictions have been met with some violent protests, mainly by ultra-Orthodox Jews. 
Many have flouted lockdown measures and attended synagogues and weddings en masse. The community, which makes up about 10% of the population, has been blamed for their disproportionate contribution to the spread of the virus, accounting for over a third of total recorded infections. Now, the global health crisis has triggered a major shift away from restaurant dining, leaving many in the culinary sector out of work. But one chef, Judy Kala, has pressed on and transformed her career into something entirely new. Judy, the author of Palestine on a Plate and Baladi, joins us uh, from London to talk about cooking as therapy. Judy, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Judy, I've been told that you were one of the first people to really talk about not just Middle Eastern cuisine, but uh, food from Palestine, which is where you're from. Yes, I think uh, there was a couple of books that were talking about Palestine, but I know my book was one of the first to have Palestine in the title, which I think was really important and sort of like groundbreaking at the time. It was very controversial also. Um, so getting it through was something really important for me. And luckily, um, I succeeded and my publisher thought it was a great idea to actually put Palestine on a culinary map and uh, this is what happened with my first book, Palestine on a Plate, and then Belladie that came straight after. So congratulations on those two books. And of course, uh, something else that I want to talk to you about is the way that all our work has shifted since the start of this health crisis. Can you tell us about your own pandemic pivot, how your work has changed? Well, I used to do supper clubs and events and food consulting for restaurants. Um, for over the last few years. And then last year, obviously, we were put in a lockdown. And for about four or five months, I just didn't know what to do. And my sister taught me how to use Zoom. Uh, I told you I'm like a little bit of a dinosaur when it comes to technology. So I set up classes, hoping even one person would show up. And it's been the best thing that I've done. Not only have people been you know, learning how to cook food, but it's sort of a therapy for us, uh, myself included, um, to spend these time together and learn and talk. And it turns into just sort of a very familiar scene. Lots of people keep coming back and meeting other people online in my classes. And we've created a little uh, Palestine uh, on a plate community, which I absolutely love. So this is basically my new job. Um, and uh, I honestly couldn't have asked for anything more. So can ordinary people like me join one of your classes, Judy? Absolutely. We're all ordinary people. Everybody can join. It's really from beginners to advanced. We all learn different things and you can choose which options of classes you want. There are some more advanced um, and others quite simple. So, yeah, it's really for everybody. It's not to sort of uh, put people aside and, you know, some people can join and some people can't. So it's a community and we want to keep everybody together, especially during these times where we're so separated from each other. Great, you have yourself a new client. Now, Judy, as you mentioned, you know, with restaurants closed, we're all spending a lot more time in our kitchens. Some of us doing a better job than others. And I thought our viewers would like to get a little tip from you while we have you here with us. How to make a snack in under 60 seconds. Let's take a look at one you made earlier. Okay. I'm just gonna show you how to make a really quick flatbread recipe for breakfast. We've got Lebne here on freshly baked homemade taboon bread. And then we're going to add on top cucumber, olives, lemon, tomato, just scatter everything as you like. And then we're going to add some dried mint and salt, olive oil, and there you have it, ready in one minute. That was a mouth-watering, simple snack recipe from Judy Carla. Judy, earlier you said that some of the work that you've done has been a little bit controversial. What does that mean? Well, I think really just uh, highlighting Palestine, our food, our culture, our history um, is very controversial, especially here in the UK. I found it very, very difficult even till now to sort of penetrate our food um, industry just purely because they didn't know where to, to put me. And um, because, you know, apparently Palestine doesn't exist. It's not on a map. Who are we? Where do we come from? And um, we're very much here so i wanted to kind of keep that conversation going and i will keep going and there are so many people as well who are doing very similar things um, which i think is really really important because there are so many millions of us out there who deserve a voice in any field um, and hoping eventually we will break through 
Uh, in particular here, because I live in the UK, the media here to accept us and, um, you know, make it kind of mainstream. Here's hoping you're certainly doing a really wonderful job of that. Now, Judy, earlier and just now we've been speaking about cuisine from the region, the politics of food, and there are a few dishes, if you agree, the origins of which are a little bit contested. So what I want to do with you is a rapid fire segment together okay. where I'll say the name of the dish and you'll tell us its nationality. Is that okay? Absolutely. I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, let's go. We'll start with hummus. Oh, the whole Middle East. Okay, falafel. <laughs> um, Egypt. Shakshuka. I think North Africa, really the whole region. Maghluba. Palestinian. Mansaf. Jordanian. Kofta. Oh, everywhere. I don't think any <laughs> You're country. being very diplomatic. <laughs> Baklava. Um, really Turkish, I think, originally, yeah. We have that in Iran too. Can we have that one, please? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know much about Iranian cuisine, but I know you have it too. <laughs> okay, and we end with kanafa. Oh, Palestinian, Jordanian, Lebanese, Syrian. <laughs> okay, good job. I do have to have a little disclaimer there saying that, you know, there is a possibility that some of what you say may be uh, debated. But that was really fun. Judy, I'd really like to thank you for uh, speaking to us here on Middle East Matters this week. Thank you. It was so nice to, have, uh, to, to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of Middle East Matters. Don't forget you can catch up with most of our news on both Facebook and Twitter. Stay tuned.